Welcome to Big Tent, Big Ideas, the live online event series from the University of Oxford as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme. Big Tent, Big Ideas brings together researchers and students from across different disciplines. We'll explore together some important subjects and ask questions about areas such as the environment, medical humanities, AI and technology, the history of disease, as well as celebrating storytelling, music, song and human identity. We're bringing you this event program online whilst we're all distanced from each other. And we hope that you are all safe and well during this difficult time. We look forward to seeing you again in person as soon as we're able and to welcoming you at, big, at future Big Tent in-person events as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme. Everyone is welcome in this Big Tent and we thank all our viewers for their ongoing support. And we thank too all the participants who'll be contributing to this series. They've given their time, their words, and their big ideas as we come together online. This series would not be possible without the support from so many people, including the Torch team. So thank you all. And so now to introduce our excellent speakers tonight. It's an honor to, on, to honor, it is an honor to host and welcome Sally Shuttleworth from the English faculty and Erica Charters from the history. Sally Shuttleworth is Professor of English Literature here at the University of Oxford. She works on the interrelations of medicine, science and culture. And between 2014 and 2019, she ran the large ERC research project, Diseases of Modern Life, 19th Century Perspectives. This project explored the medical, literary and cultural responses to the Victoria, in the Victorian age to the perceived problems of stress and overwork, anticipating many of the preoccupations of our own era. Sally's most recent book is the co-authored Anxious Times, Medicine and Modernity in 19th Century Britain, published in 2019. Erica Charters is Associate Professor in Global History and the History of Medicine at the University of Oxford, where she is also Director of Oxford Centre for Global History and the Oxford Centre for the History of Science, Medicine and Technology. Her research examines how war and disease intersect with state formation and state power particularly in colonial contexts. Her monograph, Disease, War and the Imperial State, The Welfare of British Armed Forces During the Seven Years' War, was published in 2014 and awarded the George Rosen Prize by the American Association for the History of Medicine and the Templar Medal for Best First Book by the Society for Army Historical Research. So thank you both of you for participating today. Um, I hand over now to you for what will, I'm sure, be a brilliant discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you uh, all of you for joining us. Um, this discussion came out of a discussion that Sally and I were having about her research and specifically the context that we're all in right now where we're being told to stay at home, not go out, to basically not move and in various ways how we're completely immobilized for the sake of our health and for the sake of other people's health as well. And Sally, you were talking about how this really contrasts with the research that you're doing on the 19th century in Britain, when people who were ill, invalids were actually advised to move and to travel around precisely to improve their health, which we thought was this kind of interesting contrast. Sally, do you wanna say a little bit more about these invalids on the move? Yes. Um... So, as you're saying, the, the extraordinary contrast of me thinking um, daily about people being imprisoned in their homes whilst I'm actually sitting here trying to write about those who are travelling. Um, so it's, uh, it links to the ideas in the 19th century that actually health really depended upon climate, um, what they call medical climatology. And I'm looking in particular at health resorts that sprung up especially to cater for uh, the invalid. And so these communities that were created that had only invalids and their families. Um, and so the, the ones I'm looking at particularly are Monton um, on the French Riviera and Davos in Switzerland, um, which became international resorts, but both of them had very strong English colonies. Um, and so I'm looking at the whole ideas of why it was that they thought you should travel 
um, and what sorts of treatments, and then the whole interrelations of these communities that are focused entirely around sickness, which is in many ways what we're experiencing now, I think, because all our news is utterly dominated by COVID. Um, and and it seems to me that the ways in which people were thinking in these resorts was also very similar to how we're experiencing the world now as one dominated by forms of disease. But I should note that the diseases where you had to travel were not something like smallpox, but rather tuberculosis or consumption, as they called it, um, or uh, other diseases such as um, overwork, which I'm rather fond of, particularly for <laughs> the professional people. And then other diseases such as the, um, so the, the clerical sore throat, uh, which is a wonderful invention of the 19th century. My, my sense is that probably many people will have heard of these places, these kind of health resorts, these health spas through literature, because my sense is that in 19th century literature, you have a lot of references to this notion of the invalid traveling the location. So it's almost a kind of trope, but also that there's some famous individuals. So can you give us a few examples of who we might know, what we might recognize in terms of this notion of traveling and going to the, the health resorts? Um, in yes. order to improve one's health. Yes, so um, two um, primary examples would be Robert Louis Stevenson, who was both at Monton and then at Davos, and then various other resort, uh, resorts of Saranac Lake um, in the States, for example, um, or John Addington Simmons, who's less well known, um, but was a very, very major writer in the 19th century, who again was in Monton and then in Davos. And in fact, it was his writing about Davos that really created the whole move of the English there. And I, and I think that the whole um, Davos phenomenon now is actually arising from the whole intellectual and sort of literary enclave that, Dav that um, Simmons created for himself whilst he was in Davos, because he lived there for 16 years. And he maintained that um, he was a man who could only live above 5,000 feet. Because um, what I'm also looking at is the ways in which um, uh, there was a complete shift in understanding of how you should cure things. Um, mm -hmm. And so first of all, it was you had to be warm. So you went to Monton in the winter because you had blue skies and you could be out in the open air exercising. And then suddenly, almost overnight, it shifts and you have to go to the Alps in the winter and be frozen to death, or not to death, to life. Um, and uh, so this, I, I'm also interested in how medical diagnoses and, and uh, regimes change. Mm. And they're two of the prime examples, but there are all sorts of others. Um, and then literary references to going to Davos or to Monton. Um, another famous person would be um, Catherine Mansfield in, in the 20th century, who was at Monton. Mm. I mean, I'm interested, I suppose there's two things that kind of crop up out of this, because one is thinking about the role of doctors in the service. So do, is it, do you wait for kind of, is your doctor prescribing you to go and travel? Or are they the ones who are actually controlling this? Or how much is this actually up to individuals who I'm guessing might have strong preferences for where they'd like to spend their time, especially if it's seen as part of a, a kind of um, cultural or literary personality to go to these places? Yes, uh, doctors were immensely powerful um, because what happened was that just about every resort that set up published its own statistics as to its climate um, and they were all rivals with each other and then lots of handbooks were published but they all insisted that it depended on what stage of your disease as to which resort you should go to. And so only your doctor could tell you which one you needed to go to. Um, and so this, and particularly society doctors in London, there was um, Andrew Clark, who was doctor to um, Gladstone famously, but also to Darwin, to George Eliot. He said that all the brain workers, um, and tennis and another one. So he advised, and first of all, he advised Monton, and then he switched to Davos. And so you were, you were very much in their hands, but sometimes um, patients manage to, uh, to get the doctor to send them where they wish to go. So Stevenson um, 
um, was trying to evade his parents and he managed to get um, Clark to tell him he had to go to Monton, but without his parents to look after him. <laughs> so he was very pleased. <laughs> so as always, there's a bit of negotiation going on. Yeah. I mean, the but, other thing... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that the other um, role of the doctor was really in creating the resorts. Mm. So Monton was was created and often that they have a mystique around them and a narrative. So um, James Henry Bennett went to Monton, which was just a little fishing village with, he thought, consumption. Miraculously, he declares, I was I was cured. Um, and then he sets up his his own practice. Um, but he. Um, and he's credited as being the sort of creator of Montan because what he he popularized it and, and it became a resort because of his writings, because mm -hmm. he published all over the place, both in the medical and, and other journals. Um, but um, he practiced in the resort during the winter and then in London in the summer. So you you cap, you get your market that way because you send all your own patients um, uh, from London and uh, and the, with the same in, in Davos. It was a doctor who went there, discovered it. It was a, and then people write about it. And so you, you, doctors had a real stake in in these resorts often. And and so of course because that's the other part which I find very interesting is this kind of commercial aspect, right? That these are commercial enterprises as well. And I was thinking a lot about how we talk about this notion of medical tourism. So the ability of some groups of people to travel abroad, get their medical yeah. operations done, which obviously is also a reflection of how much money, how much leisure time certain mm -hmm. groups might have. And as a historian, I'm always curious about how in some ways we want to draw parallels with what's similar in the past, but we also want to highlight what's different. So can this be likened to our practice of medical tourism? In what ways is it different, especially as a kind of commercial enterprise. Yes, yes. I, I always resist medical tourism as a definition for what I'm looking at in the 19th century, because it suggests a, sort of a level of unseriousness. Mm -hmm. um, and they're always insisting that they were health seekers, not tourists. And, um, and there's a distinction between the resorts that became sort of more for pleasure um, and those that really did focus um, uh, on illness. Um, but, but there are parallels, obviously, in, in going to a place for a, uh, a particular medical reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the other part which you mentioned, which um, I think is so fundamental to all of this is this notion of narratives, right? Of yeah. the mm -hmm. ability both of the doctors and of the patients of those traveling, of the invalids to write about their experience and partly mm -hmm. use it to promote it to other people, but also partly to form the expectations of what other people will also record. I've been thinking a lot um, in the context of the current pandemic, how many people have been encouraging us to keep diaries and to write yeah. records and to use them for future historians. And, and one of the things I often think about as a historian working on the 1700s is how when we look back, you know, 200, 300 years later, we can see reading people's writings that they actually follow a kind of format, right? There's a kind of trope that yeah. actually people unconsciously even follow what other people are writing about, model themselves on things in terms of what they think is worth recording and also what they think isn't worth recording. So I was wondering, you know, how, how much you see this certain kind of trope of what it means to be an invalid in these contexts. So there's certain formats that people follow and especially because my understanding is it becomes such a literary genre, right? It's very much, as you said, it's formed by by people of the words, men and women who write for a yes. living. Yes, yes. And it's very interesting. You can see um, because that they tended to write a lot, yeah, and particularly the, the literary invalids. And so you have um, endless letters, but also then the, the articles that they form from their letters. So you can actually see them moving mm -hmm. the materials from the personal letter to the mother that becomes part of the article. But yes, there, there, are, there are definite tropes. And in part, it depends whether you're religious or not. Mm. Um, because the religious ones um, have a, a very um, definite form, which is you know, insisting that they, they, they don't mind death and they will welcome it, etc. For those who are not religious, um, huge soul searching and largely um, the, the ones I've been looking at it's to do with work mm. and 
it's whether you've really justified your existence yet on earth. Hmm. Um, and so constantly going over you know, sort of what more they should do. And there's yeah. some wonderful examples actually of the ways in which they would often keep working right until day of death. Hmm. Uh, there was um, uh, the um, historian J.R. Green, who, and, and I should say that many of these invalids, it, they actually, it was 20 years in the dying, in the sense that they, that they had the condition and it came and it went, um, but they were living with it and trying to frame their life around it or not around it if they could for that length of time. But Green, so struggling over and over, and then in, um, in the final year, um, when it became clear that he really was dying, um, he was writing a storm. So it, it, for us, you know, the academics sitting here at the moment, uh, thinking, oh, I should be writing. Um, an extraordinary example, because uh, he, um, so he had his wife, you know, bring all the, the, the books to his bedside, and then he'd dictate. And uh, as it became clearer that he'd only got a week to left, he said, you know, just give me sleeping drafts every night because there's, I have work to do. And he continued dictating, even though his poor wife, um, she got some strain in both of her wrists, attempting to keep up with the, uh, the, the words that were flowing out. Um, so in, in, extraordinary examples. And, but also, I, I, it, it is very, very moving seeing the response of the, uh, of the relatives as well to yeah. how you cope with um, you know, a loved one um, at, at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think, I often think as a historian, what's interesting is of course, there's long periods of history in which ordinary people didn't write. Um, yeah. And not only because they weren't literate, but because the notion that you would keep your kind of daily experiences as being useful, um, it just wasn't assumed to be something that was significant. Um, and, and again, within history of medicine, I always thought it was very interesting that with the rise of social history in the 1960s and this kind of notion to get away from just looking at great men and great women at political institutions and then instead to look at the experiences of the everyday. And you see the same movement that happened within the history of medicine to try to access the patient experience rather than just thinking about doctors and rather than thinking about scientific um, achievements to think about what is it what is it like to actually have the experience of illness but then I also find that historians have this constant debate about whether you can ever access what it means to be a patient and to suffer from something beyond the medical framework that's already set up right beyond these kind of assumptions yeah. mm. yes well you see people constantly trying to cast that their own lives in in light of what the doctors are saying and the new treatments that are coming out and how they how they would orient themselves um, mm -hmm. particularly if you've gone from sort of being coddled as they said in the winter garden of, of the south to being expected to sort of be, be in the cold all day and night mm -hmm. um, and so the constant sort of processes of adjustment but in terms of the sort of the writing from below and, and sort of getting at sort of the more working class figures, it, from what for what I'm doing, there's very little because it was mostly the wealthy who, who or, or the middle wealthy who, who traveled. And although they had charities for the, the indigent uh, poor as they were consumptives, etc., these were not really the poor, I wouldn't say. And so it's not until you get the sanatoria. Um, coming in at the end of the 19th century that you get working class patients and and I haven't gone that far but I, I think it would be an absolute treasure trove to look at the, the writings of the letters from the various sanatoria. Mm. So can we talk about what what people were actually suffering from because I think this helps yeah. us also to think about types of diseases as, as you've said tuberculosis. Mm. Um, so what actually are these diseases and also what is the theory of causation in terms of why people have these diseases? Yes, um, so to start with um, tuberculosis or, or con consumption, until 1882 when Koch um, discovered that there was a bacillus causing it, it, there were various theories, but one of the dominant ones that it was, was simply that it was hereditary. Um, and so it was in the family. And so you actually, I was quite astonished to, to discover that it was, there were lots of books saying that if it was in the family, you actually, it was your duty 
to send your child or to take your child to another climate in order to prepare them for entry into the British climate. Mm. And so several years should be spent in Davos or, or, or Monton, or you should take a boat and go right around the world um, in order to experience the sail journey or, or on the sea. So the, the sense that um, to be an invalid, you didn't actually have to have any symptoms, but it's just this fear that you might suffer. And again, you know, so the, our experiences now is really helping me understand, I think, what it must have been like to live in that fear, nothing showing, but the possibility there. And so you move heaven and earth to actually make sure that, it, that your children could actually survive. But the other element then of, of TB was also that it was, um, Bennett described it as a disease of debility. And that's how it got then linked to overwork because anybody who was seen as, you know, sort of working too many hours, you know, too long, um, or, as a woman actually doing more than you ought in terms of thinking, um, you could actually then suffer um, and so have to be sent away. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm divided on this because as I say, I, I like the notion of going off for six months because you work too hard. Um, but there is also the, the worries about malingering. And, and that was um, came very much um, with the idea of the, um, the clergyman's sore throat or, or dysphonia, clericorum, as it was called, which was really um, described as um, giving too many sermons and therefore weakening your throat. Um, and there was a lot of scepticism about this, but I have to say that every resort is described as having lots and lots of clergy. Mm. So clearly they took advantage of this notion that uh, uh, sore throat and um, in Trollope's uh, Barchester Towers, the um, Reverend Vasey um, uh, Stanhope, who's meant to be, I think, the canon in residence of the cathedral, is never in residence because 10 years ago he'd had a sore throat, but now he's famous for his collection of butterflies from Italy. <laughs> I'm always fascinated how, of course, there's these different types of diseases, not only according to how they're transmitted, so whether or not people think they're contagious, but as we're seeing right now, this difference between what we classify as an epidemic and an endemic disease, right? And this, yeah. I was thinking how the epidemic that's ongoing right now and the discussions we're having about, is it worse than flu? And I think also people's recognition that maybe we don't talk about about the numbers of people who do die from the flu each year is this kind of reminder that of course the opposite of an epidemic isn't no disease at all, but it's rather yeah. endemic diseases, right? Yeah. So these diseases that a society lives with, even though it causes very high death rates. And I was struck thinking about yeah. how in some ways what you're discussing is the society that's come to accept a certain kind of disease as being just part of it and has kind of built built up cultural practices around it or different practices around it. Because of course, this is the same period when you have cholera, which yes. is very much described as a foreign epidemic disease yeah. coming in with quite um, violent, uh, striking symptoms, um, which people are very worried of. But of course, over the long period, more people are dying from these endemic diseases, fevers, tuberculosis. Yes. And again, I, I think you know, we hear the statistics about how many children died in the Victorian period, but you know, so to actually understand what it meant for them, because it, there would often been a, a, a thought that actually they couldn't have been so invested in their children, but you read the letters and of course they were. Um, yeah. And so it is that, that sense that they lived almost perpetually in the way that we're living now. Yeah. Um, and so, Although, yes, we, we have an epidemic, you know, for them, you know, it was actually more lethal than what's happening to us now. The sheer numbers were extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. I think it's always a, an interesting reminder about how, how we conceptualize risk, what yeah. we think about in terms of kind of acceptable numbers of people who are dead or even acceptable numbers of people who are chronically ill, right? Because I yes. think in some ways yeah. that captures yes. what's happening. Can I ask about, because of course you mentioned at the beginning, and I think it's such a fundamental way of thinking about disease is that disease is associated with location. And of course this gets to the heart of why people need to travel or be yes. above mm -hmm. 5,000 feet. So yeah. can you explain a little bit more about this longstanding view that disease is often about climates and place rather yeah. than a kind of invading the virus or bacteria? Yes, yes, so it's an idea that goes right back to the Greeks and Hippocrates and, uh, who had a, uh, a piece on air, air's water and places. 
Um, but what happens, and, and so as a practice, it's been there right through in medicine, the notion that it's good to travel. But prior to the, the, the 19th century, really without any precision as to why or where to go, you, you got the, the, the development of spas very much in the 18th century. But that was a specific water, whereas in the 19th century with, with the medical climatology, it was very, very specific about the, the forms of humidity, how dry the air, what altitude you were at, um, levels of sunshine. Um, and it was also, I think, strongly linked to the development of pollution in, uh, in Britain, the sense. Um, mm. And so it starts really with James Clark, who's a doctor in the... Um, 1820s, um, who starts to write about the need to travel and, and go to particular uh, mm -hmm. locations. And from then on, you get a huge growth in statistics, um, people recording every day you know, so that the precise rainfall, uh, etc. in these resorts. Um, and it, it was thought that, uh, and I suppose rightly, that the, there was a real relationship between the body and the mind and, and, and the climate. Mm. Um, and that if you got that balance right, then you could not only stay the disease, but many people uh, claimed you could actually cure it. Um, mm. And Bennett in, in Montan maintained you could cure. I mean, I always find it fascinating too, because in some ways, the 19th century and Britain in the 19th century is this period of intense debate, right? Over causation, over these theories of contagion, um, of whether or not disease is located, for example, either in urban centers, which definitely follows what people observe compared to rural areas, which seem much more healthy, whether it's actually kind of rooted in unsanitary locations within urban centers, but then also how you can see it on a global scale. So in, in my work, when people are thinking about the, the British empire and their experiences overseas, disease, again, be, appears to be located in climates, in tropical climates, of course, which is why we inherit this notion of tropical diseases and tropical medicine. Yes. Yes. And so this kind of interesting way in which observations might be correct in some ways, even if the kind of underlying mechanism doesn't tie into what we now know through bacteriology. Yes, no, I think definitely so. But another aspect of it all was the style of life you would live there. And again, this was such a change because if you're an invalid in Britain, you were coddled and you're not allowed outside and lying on the sofa all day, etc. If you went to these resorts, you were encouraged to get out there and walk you know, along the seaside, up into the, up into the hills. Um, and then if you went to Davos, you were encouraged to go out tobogganing and, um, and skiing later on. Um, oh. And so a very outdoors life, um, which was obviously so much healthier for yeah. the individual. So one of the reasons that people probably recovered more was simply that they were living such a, a more healthy life in general. I mean, I, I always think this is the, the wonderful thing about a historical record and looking back is that not only can you see a period when people had debating views and actually there was a lot of uncertainty about it, yeah. but sometimes people were prescribing remedies that might have worked, but not for the reasons that yeah they thought, which of course is, I always think this reminder for us today, we're in a similar period about uncertainty, not being entirely sure. You can see how debates become very polarized the same way they did in the 19th century. Mm. And of course, I always think as a historian, it might be that 150 years from now, many of the things that we assume to work for these mechanisms, we might discover um, in this kind of ultimate historical humility that actually we've misunderstood various yeah. mechanisms. Yes, yeah, definitely. And um, it's quite interesting looking at what happens um, in the 1880s when Koch has, has discovered the, the reserves, yeah. um, because people's, you, you'd expect that patterns of behavior would suddenly change because it was worldwide news, and, um, but they don't. Um, and in, in Davos, they, are, they start claiming, or, or it had been claimed before, but they use it as an excuse that the, the air was antiseptic. And so, you know, if you came, if this was the selling point now of Davos, that uh, you could escape the bacillus if you came and, uh, and lived at, uh, at 5,000 feet. I mean, I think <laughs> this, this is always, again, a very interesting 
idea for historians of medicine, historians of, of disease, right? So do, when the scientific knowledge changes, do actual human practices change? Yeah. And I thought it was really fascinating that actually these health resorts, what they do is they adapt, right? That in some yeah. ways they're, they're able to, to, to move into this new era, maintain themselves mm -hmm. as centers and maintain their popularity. And, and in some ways we'd say, you know, they're rebranding according to bacteriology. Yes, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. it's, it reminds me also, I, th I think very often because I work on the history of disease, people assume that I just look at the kind of bacteria or something in the past, yes. but actually what fascinates me, and I don't know if it's the same for you, but what fascinates me is how disease is really inseparable from human activity, right? So in the same way, when we think about the current pandemic, a lot of what we're discussing is the way human activity, cultural practices, handshaking, the kind of everyday gestures we have are actually what's responsible for transmission patterns. Um, this is about human activity and cultural practices much more than just thinking about scientific knowledge. But it also always strikes me that humans are amazingly adaptable, right? When you have a new, yeah. when you have new scientific knowledge, what do people do? Then they, they use it to their own advantage in some ways. They often manipulate it. They come up with new commercial enterprises. Um, so I like the idea that they're kind of taking what they have um, and, and profiting in various ways. Is there any kind of um, parallel with what we're seeing today? Mm. Um, well, I think the adaptation that we're seeing today is sort of parallel in a sense, but what struck me is, is just how extraordinarily fast it happens. You know, mm. The fact that you, you now automatically step several there. You know, if you see anybody coming, you move. You know, um, so these that it, and that's happened. What in the space of two or three weeks, you become absolutely accustomed to new modes. So, and I think you can see that as well in the in the nineteenth century. Um, but you you find all sorts of ways of justifying continuing your previous sort of activities as, as well as uh, somehow now fitting into the new new regime. Hmm. So so what happens? That I mean, because I was thinking, obviously we all know we've heard of Davos in various ways. So what's the kind of the after history, the afterlife of these health resorts? What happens to them? Um, so from the 1890s um, beginning, um, they, they start to develop um, sanatoria that are closed. So no longer do you have your, you know, the wife and the husband and family all living in the hotel, which was the, the previous mode. It, it moves into a strictly controlled um, sanatorium environment. Um, so it becomes heavily medicalized and controlled. So mm -hmm. very, very different world. Um, so what I'm looking at is really up until sort of 1900. Um, so, mm. yeah, it's what I'm looking at, I suppose, is sort of medicine outside a medical framework. Hmm. Hmm. And other other examples. I know, for example, that you're working on something or you're finishing up a special issue that's coming out to do with um, sleep and stress at the moment and i'm i'm because i'm just thinking that i know people will be very interested in this idea of overwork and stress yeah. in the yeah. context do you want to talk a little bit more about that project oh yes that's good um so um it's based on a conference um i did with the sleep scientist russell foster and my diseases of modern life team at the royal society on sleep and stress past and present. And we actually run from the medieval through to current times and current science, looking at how people understood sleep and, and the impact of stress in, all, in the, all the various ways it's been considered in the past. Um, and in my own work um, uh, piece, I'm, I'm looking um, at overworked professionals and uh, the problems of sleep for them. Um, particularly Gladstone, who had problems sleeping when he was prime minister and was sent off by Andrew Clark to, uh, to Montan, or rather to Cannes, to, uh, to recover. Um, mm. So, uh, yes. Mm. 
it's quite interesting. Uh, all sorts of um, things I discovered, such as sort of, um, ideas of mindfulness and how to get to sleep by imagining the breath in your body, and uh, and then all the sleeping um, drafts, which are exactly the same as uh, our problematic um, uh, sleeping pills now. So lots of interesting parallels. Yeah, I was going to say all sorts of interesting parallels there. It's a really fantastic project that sees the modern life. Um, and I would encourage people to check it out. I think we now have time to start opening um, the floor to questions as one does in a live event. And Philip, you're able to take us through that. I am indeed. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Sally, for that wonderful discussion. And um, I certainly enjoyed this imaginative journey um, into the past and into different places. And uh, I know that people watching have had wonderful questions as well. So I wanted to bring together a series of questions we've had. One had been about class, which you touched on a little bit, about how much access was there for the working class to these kind of institutions. But it leads, leads to another question, which is actually one about gender. And is there a difference in the way that men and women are treated? Are there distinct gender differences? Uh, around the kind of illnesses that are, are presented, described, diagnosed, and, and, and treated. And how much, finally, does this actually uh, relate to questions of leisure and lifestyle, as well as actually sort of strictly medical questions? So one, one listener was asking about how does this relate to things like the Grand Tour and questions of tourism. So I've smooshed together sort of three <laughs> different questions there and hoping that you might be able to, to run with something in those. Woo, right, I'll start with class. Um, so yes, you, you are right that um, I'm, I'm looking really at, at sort of middle class upwards. Um, but interestingly, the backlash against um, that this form of, of travel came in the 1890s when doctors in England started arguing that this is really unfair and actually you don't need to travel abroad and you could create your own um, um, sanatorium in your back garden, if you have a back garden, um, and that um, led to the, uh, you've maybe seen these sh sheds that people had with uh, revolving platforms, so you could sit, you know, even in the rain in England and actually uh, be outside, and, uh, but, and that's linked then to the development of the sanatoria, which did take working class. Um, and as for gender, yes, um, real differences. So the overwork was really meant to be for the male, you know, sort of um, be he a banker or a, uh, doctors very much believe that they've suffered from overwork um, and others. For women, um, it was thought, um, well, there was quite a lot about the modern woman and if, um, the wonderful oh. novel by Beatrice Harridan uh, that people hear or know of but have never read normally called Ships That Pass in the Night that's set in Davos and that's a modern young woman who's done too much thinking and um, studying and uh, attending political meetings who gets worn out. So that's another trope of the, the sort of figure that could um, be there, but also that the whole idea of uterine pathology and that you're worn out by you know, your, your mere reproductive system. So those were other, you know, worn out young women was another category that, that you'd find. And then, so what was the final bit here? Um, it was about the relationship between sort of medicine and illness and, and leisure and the idea oh, of- Oh yes, oh, the, on the ground. Go, when you say Montan, um, I think of a lovely place in the south of France yes. with gorgeous trees and a very agreeable yeah. climate, but you've taken us through a medical history of it. Yes, yeah, yes. So there is a link to the Grand Tour but I think we have to be careful to differentiate. Some people who went on the Grand Tour actually went with their physician because they were ill, but mostly it was tourism and education. Um, whereas the places I'm looking at tried absolutely to say, we are not for that sort. There was a, a phrase they used, you are health seeking, not sightseeing. Um, and, but nonetheless, a lot of the, the memoirs of the um, professional men who went there sort of said, you know, this is rather wonderful because it is legitimate idleness. You know, so I am allowed to be here by the seashore and see the, the olive groves and the blossoms and not work, but it is legitimate because <laughs> it is medical. So um, um, it was, you know, 
I was quite interested in the, in the way in which medical authority is used there to justify, often for these people who can't stop themselves working. So there's um, the Baptist minister, um, Charles Spurgeon, he went to uh, Monton um, for, I think, sort of 12 years or, or more before he, he uh, every winter before he died. But whilst he was there, he sat in Bennett's garden um, and dictated sermons all day long. You know, so <laughs> there's a sense that it's idleness and it's beauty, but also you've know, got to make sure it's work as well. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, my day job is teaching Russian literature and all the 19th century novels I know, which are about spa towns and things, are actually all to do with getting married and meeting yeah. people. And there's an interesting interaction that uh, yeah. between talking about, you talked about the sort of end of life exhaustion there, the end, uh, whereas, whereas a, a different stage there. I've got a couple of other questions which have come in around sanatoria, given that that's something we've been talking about. Someone has asked, come writing from Saskatchewan or writing about Saskatchewan, what actually happened to those buildings and those institutions? Have they survived in any form or what's happened to them physically or culturally? Um, and, and someone has also asked, uh, in fact, a couple of people have asked, what about the locals and their reaction to these incomers, um, yeah. given that they're coming with medical conditions, uh, yes. some anxiety about this. So there's, there's a, a whole group of questions that have come in. Yes, so the buildings, um, so Saranac Lake, virtually the entire town, because there are a lot of individual cottages, has been preserved as um, a, a sanatorium. So you can go and, and see them as they were. Um, others um, get repurposed as, as hospitals. Um, and there are quite a lot that are just mothballed. And um, there's one I want to go and see in Italy that uh, apparently is just completely abandoned. And so, you know, these eerie institutions that, that, that can be. Um, so, yes, a variety of, of um, things happening. But I find that sanatoria, along with insane asylums, tend to get made into fancy apartments these days as well, um, quite interestingly. Um, but then um, with reference to the, um, the, the response of the locals, yes, it shifts around 1900. So up until that time, they're welcoming them in with open arms because this, this is you know, obviously bringing in lots of money. Um, often it's the locals. So it's an it's a interesting sort of form of colonization because although they describe themselves as English colonies, in fact, um, they're probably being exploited rather than the other way around because it's the locals who are building the hotels, etc. But once the idea of the, uh, tuberculosis being infectious arrives, then you get you get the worries. You know, why should we be letting these people in? Um, and I've just been looking at ship's diaries for invalids going out to Australia and New Zealand, and you know, up until 1900, it's yes, come. And then suddenly the ships are turning up and the locals are saying, no, we're not going to let these ships in. Again, a real parallel with what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Erica, is there anything there that, that, that resonates with things that you work on from your, your slightly different perspective? Well, mine, I have to say, is a little more grim. So I work very much on disease during war, so I tend to look at soldiers and sailors. And one of the interesting things is, in, even in the 1700s, because a lot of it is about um, European wars that are being fought in the colonies, you still do see this association, which is very much confirmed through observation that there's more disease in foreign locations. And so you actually do get, even in the 1700s, discussion about sending usually officers back home for what they call a change of air, back to what they see as being a more temperate climate in the hopes that that will cure them. But then you also see this being done for um, soldiers and sailors. So there is this notion of the kind of, again, like Sally was saying, this very long standing tradition of disease being associated with locations and with climates, not so much with thinking about it as a kind of what we now think of in terms of bacterial invasion and in particular practices. Um, I think, as people have said with the, the question of leisure, what I find very interesting is for my time period, because I'm looking at very, you know, common people, especially when we're thinking about soldiers and sailors, um, just having a rest in a hospital is a kind of luxury in some ways. And of course, it's one of the things I find very interesting when we're doing history of medicine is what I'm often looking for in the record as an example of medicine 
isn't so much a kind of therapeutic in terms of vaccines or drugs, but very often just having five days where you're in a hospital, you're not having to work, you're not having to labor, and you're also being given very um, you know, plentiful diets. That's actually a quite tangible form of medical care, but it's not something that we might usually expect to be able to find in the record. So I think in some ways, um, linking into Sally's points about what are these medical practices, right? So this notion of rest, the notion of rich foods or whatnot can actually be quite, um, quite a potent form of, of healing in the past. Thank you, thank you both. Now, um, a couple of questions have come in on a sort of religious spiritual topic and we've had the Parsons with their sore throats. And um, one of the questions uh, was, is there a connection between sort of physical treatment of the body and questions of sort of moral regeneration and moral capacity to uh, uh, and ideas inherent about uh, about sort of character and it, it soulfulness or, or character. Um, and another one was given that people are traveling, they may be traveling to different parts of the world with different religious cultures with different religious traditions. Is there any sense of that uh, physical journey, uh, that, that physical journey might expose people to rather different spiritual ideas when they get to wherever they're going or when they meet people in these often quite diverse uh, communities? So mm -hmm. do, what's the head up with that one? Um, on the moral, um, what I found quite interesting is, is the um, difference um, between um, Montan and um, Davos. Because Spurgeon, who is this very famous um, preacher, talked about the fact that uh, you could be closer to God um, if you were in Montan because you were, Jesus went to the seaside and was also in olive groves. So a wonderful explanation. And so it's argued that you really should go there for your spiritual sort of regeneration. And, and Spurgeon offered it very much as, as, as a form of spiritual regeneration as well as um, a, a sort of improvement of the body. But then we, um, with the growth of Davos, they start to um, uh, market themselves as being more moral because more manly than being effeminate lounging around in the south. And so there's a sense that if you were British, you really ought to be going to the cold um, northern climes of, of, of the Alps to strengthen your resolve. Um, so it, it's, again, it's, it's forms of marketing. But I think the whole moral issue is constantly there people trying to justify their form of life, you know, pondering on it, you know, um, Stevenson's forever wondering, you know, sort of, is it right that I'm taking up people's time and energy and money in this way? So a, a lot of soul searching. Um, and then with reference to religion, obviously I'm, ju I'm just looking at, at Europe, but I have been interested in the way in which um, picking up on Erica's point about sort of get, going out to the tropics, etc. That a lot of, of people coming through were actually come were um, serving soldiers coming back from India, um, and there there is quite a lot of Indian philosophy that starts to mingle in, and this is in my sleep research as well as the um, as the health resort res uh, research. So it's it's really quite interesting that. That, uh, that, that there is a, a responding to and picking up of ideas, um, obviously not wholesale transformation, but um, openness to new ideas, certainly. I mean, I would just add, um, Sally was pointing out that the word bracing comes up a lot in descriptions. And, and I was thinking in terms of what, what it means to say that a place is bracing and how it seems to have these kind of moral or constitutional um, connotations as well as a physical connotation. But I also think I, I've been struck again since we were talking about this notion of narratives and people keeping diaries that of course the very practice of keeping a diary had this Christian spiritual origin and definitely in my period you know this is about a process of self-examination mm -hmm. and so I always it always strikes me that even today when people are being encouraged to keep diaries that we're actually continuing on this kind of long Christian Western practice, even though we don't quite recognize the roots of it in various ways about self-examination um, and penitence in some form. Yes, very definitely. Mm. Now, I've had a, a couple of questions which are a bit presentist in, uh, in, in nature, and we've been deftly sort of trying to talk about the past as the past, as a 
foreign country, but we keep coming back to parallels with the present day. And one of them has been pointing out um, the, the presence in our current discussion about our relationship with the animal world and the natural world more, mm -hmm. more, uh, more generally. And, and is there a discussion in the text you're looking at, the periods you're looking at, uh, does the discussion also take in that question or is this a purely human uh, debate at this period? Because of course we know that the debates uh, are around COVID and markets and that there are all kinds of really quite, uh, I think, under-examined um, questions of how we perceive and talk about other, other cultures in this completely global uh, debate where we're at at, at the moment. Um, and the other question was a, was a perhaps a, a slightly simpler and less not your one was, has there been a really, have you come across a really good piece of advice in the travelogues or the diaries or the writings from the past, which we could employ now to help us through the present moment? Is there something we can learn from our forebears to help us through things? Hmm. Um, well, with reference to animals, um, yes, that there was concern in the 19th century because you've got anthrax and, you, and, and you've got sort of the um, uh, bovine tuberculosis. Um, and one of the people I've been working on, um, Benjamin Ward Richardson, who was behind the diseases of modern life and wrote a book on them, um, he argued um, in the 1850s that what they ought to be doing is keeping statistics um, on a, a local and hence national basis um, every week of diseases, um, both human and animal. Um, and he was told he was way ahead of his time and sort of to come back in 50 years. But uh, so there was a real sense that they should be doing this work and thinking about it. Um, but yes, it didn't really take off. And I think we're, we're suffering from that now. Um, I don't know whether you want to say anything on that one, uh, Erica. Or... It's, it's an interesting point. I haven't, and I was thinking, I, I don't know if people comment about animals specifically uh, in the 1700s so much, obviously they work very closely with them and especially when we're thinking about armies. But I was thinking about people's views about the relationship with what they see as being the natural world. And obviously the 19th century, I think you see a kind of transformation in how that's seen. So it, it does strike me that the way that we talk about the animal world might be similar to how we're also thinking about our relationship with what we see as being the natural world. And especially, I think as a historian, you can see that there's a transformation about whether we think of disease as a kind of natural occurrence that has a cycle to it that maybe we can't do much about, but that we just live with, um, which is a slightly more common view that I see in the 1700s than to this notion that actually we can try to transform it and that we should have an ability to contain and to manage it or even to this notion that we're somehow responsible for these outbreaks because of our, our poor relationship or kind of imbalance that we have with the natural world. So I'm also kind of interested in how even those views are historicized, right? They too have a history on various levels. And I suppose thinking about that, um, there is the human and then there's the natural or the environmental, but then there's the interesting sort of blurred gap between. Um, and so someone has talked about lap dogs and I'm thinking of kind of exotic pets in cages around the place and the interesting way that we we bring the natural world in and and commodify it um, but it, it's a sort of indelible trace of of a world out there um, and then periodically you know you mentioned bovine um, tuberculosis and anthrax but there's a sort of more domestic side to our relationship with the natural world and I know lots of cat owners are worried about what they should be doing at the moment with their yes, yes, felines yeah yeah but um, to think about the, the second part of the question about the sort of uh, advice um, mm -hmm. and things one could learn, um, there was a real emphasis on the beauty of, of the, the natural landscape in these places and how one of the curative forms was actually just going out into that beauty and, and responding uh, to it. Um, so a sense of landscape as... Uh, as I suppose sort of mindfulness you know, cure in, in, in current terms. But another piece of um, advice that, uh, or, or desire that um, they had that I, I really um, think uh, we, we should not have forgotten is the suggestion that all hospitals should have gardens, that people should be able to be wheeled out into the gardens. Um, and Paxton actually, um, Joseph Paxton, who did Crystal Palace, he suggested that all hospitals should have a winter garden attached to them um, so that all patients could 
you know, take the air and, uh, and be surrounded by natural plants, um, which is a wonderful idea, I think. And, and you actually see it, what's interesting is you see it in the British Army and Navy, um, even in the mm -hmm. 1700s, that there's a recognition both that gardens are useful, especially because they're worried about things such as scurvy. So they know that yeah. fresh, fresh things in general are much better. So what I kind of find amazing is you can see even from early on that throughout the empire, you you see soldiers planting gardens everywhere mm -hmm. for the produce, but they also, they're very explicit that they also think the very activity of gardening as a kind of exercise, a regular discipline also leads to their health. So I've been struck by how, I, and I've always been curious whether it's a kind of longstanding British tradition, because obviously to me, there's been a lot of discussion in the current epidemic about people's gardens, who has access to gardens, mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. So both the, the product of these gardens, but also the very activity of gardening as being crucial to this notion of health and stability. Yes, and in parallel um, with the discussion about opening up gardens um, and playing fields, etc., at the moment, uh, again in the late 19th century, they they did argue um, rather hopelessly, I think, in the sense that that, that um, London squares should be that were closed off should be opened up when the rich go away, only when they go away, but but uh, um, and also as a movement for window boxes for the poor, in the, the sense that these things do really matter. Um, an impact on uh, on health. Well, that, that sounds very resonant for where we are at the moment as we stare at the sky and see the lack of vapour trails and yes. about the increased air quality or mm. home much more and think about our gardening and uh, we can often do that unconsciously without thinking about those people who don't have access to that or the time or whose careers or jobs or life circumstances mean that those are actually rather luxurious uh, pleasures in in life and the, and the products of, of, of great privilege. I'm just looking at the live chat to which I have access here to see whether any more questions have uh, have popped uh, up in our last few minutes. Some people want to sort of go back to the leisure and health question a little bit more. Uh, and uh, someone has asked, uh, when people go in the earlier 19th century, for instance, Keats going to Italy for his consumption, um, they sort of do it off their own bat. When does this become a much more regulated, sort of industrialized product of uh, official medicine and and, the, and the, the establishment of practices? Can one can one make uh, can one date it simply or conveniently, or is it is it more complicated than that? Um, well, it starts in the eighteen twenties, but really, I think it's from the eighteen fifties onwards. Um, when you get all the guidebooks with the specific, you know, sort of. Um, you know, statistics for each place and doctors who are specialising particularly in where to go. Um, and also, of course, as soon as the railways come, it makes it so much easier for people to travel. So it, it, it opens it up in ways that it was not really possible in, in earlier decades. And the, the railway is a fascinating thing because it's a great uh, engine for mobility but at the same time it's a greatly anxious place because you meet all kinds of people who come together in a tight space before yeah. traveling together and then going off to their it is a sort of trope in a lot of 19th century literature that all the bad things happen on route to somewhere or <laughs> uh, maybe that's just because i've read too much anna karenina but there is something <laughs> yeah <laughs> not the best example of how to yes uh, well russian literature always does does i'm afraid <laughs> um there's a question which has just come up now, which I think is a really interesting one. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, says the, says the, the question, uh, the person's put the question, about coronavirus and reactions to it as being like a war um, and the, the military rhetoric. So I suppose the question from this person is, do you find that rhetoric in the documents you're looking at? And I suppose I'd like to just tag one on saying, how useful is that metaphorical use of language? Can we ever get away from it? And I'm, Susan Sontag is, crawling up my spine yeah. here, as I say, thinking about illness as metaphor. How, how do we respond to, to this use of language that we're, we're living through at the moment? And how do you see it in a historical perspective? Mm. Yes, well, well, I think it's deeply unhelpful, actually, because of all the, you know, the apparatus that goes with thinking about war and the oppositions um, that are normally people against people. And you're actually seeing that now playing out in our international politics in, in ways that's really not helpful. 
um, but certainly in the 19th century that they had it, um, you know, with um, uh, cholera, you know, seen as coming from the East, etc. war, you know, it, so the, there are all these connotations, but when um, the uh, tubercle and the bacillus was um, uh, discovered, there were um, pictures of St. George the dragon and, and the killing and, and the sense again that it's, you know, we will conquer by killing the, um, the enemy. So it, it, it's always there, but I, I think it's um, loose usage doesn't help. And Eric and I were just talking earlier about epidemic of sleeplessness, which has become a very common phrase. And again, I think it's not helpful. Um, because that that form of language then creates its own responses and um, and, and cultural assumptions. I, I mean, know. one one thing which I think is interesting is obviously, I think especially with this this movement towards bacteriology and this conceptual framework in which disease is something that invades you from outside instead of what I see in my period, which is actually disease is about a kind of imbalance that's within you and needs to be you need to be rebalanced. And so I can see how this war metaphor and this notion that it's an external threat that somehow you can keep separate, therefore becomes more common. But I, I would also say, look, as someone, as a historian of war, what I also find interesting is, is our way of thinking about war also changes, right? So there's a long period, the period that I work on in which war is seen as part of a natural process, something that just occurs within societies. And it's seen, it's a terrible thing, like terrible weather, but it's, but it's natural. It's not something that actually one can control and contain. And so I also think it's interesting that in the same way that we've kind of borrowed it because we also now see disease as being something not that's a natural process, but something that needs to be seen as external and something that we can control and manage is, is another way of thinking about how, about our assumptions about our relationship, either with war or with disease and exactly where we stand in position to them. Well, thank you both of you, I think our time has come to an end. Rather remarkably, this is the first time I've ever done this and the time has just rushed by. There are many more questions we could have taken and my apologies to those members of the audience out there who asked questions that we couldn't get round to tackling. But thank you, Erica, thank you, Sally, for really taking us through those big ideas and for making us all welcome in this big tent at the time being. So thank you. Good luck with your work and helping us all to address both the past and the challenges of the present. So to everyone out there who's been watching, we look forward to seeing you again in a week's time. Next week, we will meet at 5 p.m. on Thursday, the 23rd of April. That is, of course, Shakespeare's birthday, and we'll be delighted to welcome Emma Smith in a discussion which I'm sure we'll take in Shakespeare and much else beside. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for bearing with me as I struggle with this brave new world of social distancing, but it's made me feel very much part of the big community out there. And good luck and keep well. Thank you all. <laughs>